of our series called The Main Thing, where we're talking about who we are as a church, the foundation of Good Shepherd, the history, the stories that have birthed who we are. And we're talking about that we are a Lutheran church, but we are also a Christian church. And this is meant to unite, to bring people from all walks of life that they know that they have a place here at Good Shepherd. But we are a Lutheran church, so what does that mean? As a Lutheran church, there are some things that we hold near and dear to our heart. We hold them near and dear to our heart, but we hold them with an open hand, knowing that God is one that authors the faith, that God is the one who breathes life into the church. And so the things that make us Lutheran is we take the Bible seriously. We come to God's word for faith and life. It is where we understand who we are in the grand scheme of where we land in the narrative of faith. We have sacraments of communion and baptism. And you'll see these in other churches, but in the Lutheran tradition, they are the vehicles where God gets grace into us. They are ways by way God saves us. They are not things that we do, but they are things that God does in us and through us, that God is the primary actor and we are the receivers of the good. We believe that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We don't merit our salvation. God gives us salvation. It isn't done by our works, but it is done by faith, which God also gives. And this is all done through Jesus Christ. There's a famous theologian, Karl Barth, and it's a fun phrase. People would ask him, when were you saved? And he would say on Easter morning in AD 33, it is because of what Jesus done that we are saved. When we preach and teach, we divide the word by law and gospel. Law is the do's of scripture and gospel is the done's. The law holds up a mirror and we get to see where we fall short, but the freedom of the gospel gives us life to live and to breathe as we are given the Holy Spirit. We are a confessional tradition. We have the creeds. Every Sunday, we will say the Apostles' Creed together to affirm our faith. But we also have things like the Oxford Confession, which are the boundaries of how we live and breathe in faith. We're also a cross-centered theology. Everything we know about faith and who we have and breathe starts at the cross and it ripples and emanates out from there. These things are what make us Lutheran, but we are a Lutheran church, but we are also a Christian church first. Last week, we talked about how it is Christ alone that salvation comes, that that is the cornerstone of our theology, and it was a watershed moment for Luther. It helped him shape theology that was the fuel for the Reformation that brought the faith back to God and that we get to be a part of today. The year was 1517, and the Pope was wanting to build, build St. Peter's Basilica. And so he issued things called indulgences to help pay for this. Did the Pope have money to do this alone? Yes. Why didn't they use that money? I don't know. But they sold indulgences. And the way they sold indulgences was to get people out of purgatory. Now, the theology of purgatory throughout the church history was not meant to be a time of punishment. It was meant to be a time of refining. It was meant to be a time where in between this life and the next, that God prepares us to be with him. But the theology in the Middle Ages changed. And no longer was this a space where God preps us, but it was a place where God punishes us. It's a place where God persecutes us. And if you want to get out, if you buy this paper for $49.99, this and salvation can be yours. But that was only for people with means. What were poor people to do? How were poor people to get their salvation? They sold themselves into slavery. They sold family members. They sold all that they owned in hopes of helping neighbors and friends that were in purgatory. And this ticked off a young Augustinian monk who saw this and said, something's wrong here. This isn't as it should be. In October 31st of 1517, 
he nailed 95 reasons why there were some problems happening in the Catholic Church, the medieval Catholic Church of its time. And this was the start of deep rumblings that were to rock the Catholic Church. Luther took issue with the idea of papal authority, that there was people in an ivory tower. There were priests and leaders way away from the people who were dealing with life that were interpreting scripture, and we had to take their word for it. He took issue with that. He took issue with that the Pope could pardon people but they have to pay to get out. This was a moment that led to Reformation, that led to Luther being excommunicated, being an outlaw. It led to war and conversations, but it led us back to the gospel. And the Lutherans are known today, which is our big contribution to the body of faith, that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, that we are justified that we are made right. Grace and faith, not of our own works, but a gift from God. How many of you have ever received a gift that you definitely didn't deserve? I think we have all been there in that space. Maybe it was a present. Maybe you were doing the bare minimum at work and your boss comes to you and you get a raise and you're like, cool, sounds great. We've all been there. It was uh, 2012, and I was in college. I was a junior in college, and I was taking a class in postmodern philosophy. It was boring. It was horrible. I didn't want to take it, but I had to. And as we started class, I realized that this is going to be the death of me. And, you know, sometimes you find yourself in class, and then sometimes you find yourself on a very beautiful day just kind of being outside, and you happen to miss class, and then you happen to miss class again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And then you get to the end of the semester, and you find out that, oh, no, I'm going to fail. This is not good. So I came to the professor. I was like, hey, what do I need to do? He's like, well, you've got 12 days, and you have 12 papers to write. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on top of all your other classes. So... I write like I am running out of time, if you know that cultural reference. And I write and I write and write, and what I produce is garbage. It is a hot garbage. You know like when you put your cans out at the end of the street on like a 90 degree day, and you walk by it and you get that whiff? That's what I produced. That's what it was. And I gave it in, I turned it in, and I said, Lord, it is in your hands. I'm an idiot. And I was waiting for my grade to post, and I got an A. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I go, his, his professor's name is Dr. Van Heemst, and I say, hey, I know what I did was terrible. <laughs> this is not good. Tell me why. He's like, well, here's the thing, Jake. You did the work, and it was not good. It wasn't good. But I'm hoping that this moment can change the trajectory of you as a student. You have promise, you have giftings, but if you do this, this is not going to help you. I did not deserve grace, but it changed my life, and it changed how I saw being a student, being a pastor, being a parent. And there are times that I think, honestly, we don't deserve grace. We're speeding, and the officer pulls us over, and we get a warning instead. We get mad, and we accidentally yell at our kids, and our kids say, no, it's okay. We forget to pay a bill and we get a late fee and it's on us to pay the bills because it's our responsibility as we split out household tasks and our spouse comes to us and says, it's okay, we'll figure it out. We say something dumb to a friend and they stay put and they forgive us. In these moments, we are experiencing a beauty that comes from the very heart of God. People embody it. We experience it, but it's found in the very heart of God and it's something called grace. God's heart towards us is one of grace. Grace is constantly and lavishly being poured out upon our lives. And it is grace that saves us. It is grace that transforms us. And it makes us right before God. And all of this is mediated by faith. We are saved by grace through faith. And we talk about grace, grace this, grace that. We've been seeing amazing grace every now and again. But what is grace? And I love this definition. Grace is the generous outpouring of all that is good, all that we need, issued from the very heart of God with no strings attached. No strings attached, all that we need, a gift that we simply accept. That's not the world we live in. The world we inhabit takes work. You have to do things to get things. 
Think about the American dream. If you want to have a nice house, a nice life, have provide for your family, it doesn't just happen. You can't just sit on your blessed assurances and hope that it happens, right? You have to work for it. Think of being a student, trying to get into the college that you want. You are going up against so many other people and you want to stand out. So you do things that you really don't want to do in order to stand out. In sports, I remember when I was in youth sports and it's gotten so much worse now that we're in the age that we're in. But if you want to continue to play and get a starting spot, you can't just do YMCA leagues. You have to do travel ball, special ball all the other ball. You have to do all these things just so you can potentially get a starting spot and hope that there's no politics in who gets to play. Promotion. You and someone else. You have to stand out. You have to do so many things to make sure that you get that promotion. We have to make a name for ourselves. We have to do the work. We have to stand out. We have to strive. We have to sweat. We have to make it happen. And this is why to the very core of our being, we struggle with grace. It's why in our spiritual life, we feel the pull to have to do things to make God like us. That there's this innate feeling that if I'm, I've got to do something. It's on me in some way, shape or form. It's on my shoulders because if I'm not doing it, then God, you're not loving me. It's why in our services, we set it up a certain way. We confess. There's absolution. We receive good news. The word is spoken. And we receive communion together. And these are the vehicles, the means of grace, the way that God gets grace to us. And it helps unwire the belief that somehow we have to save ourselves, that somehow we have to jump through hoops to get God to respond to us. We don't have to do that. Paul spoke to this very nature in our epistle that Ava wrote, or that Ava shared with us today. That there's this crazy idea that grace and faith, that somehow it's God who has taken upon himself to save us and to bring us home. And so we're going to dive into Ephesians a little deeper. And it says this in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Three, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. You are dead. We are dead We can't save ourselves. Paul is speaking to the reality that we find ourselves in. Sin is death. And if you were to go around the room and ask, has anybody witnessed or experienced death? It is our universal unifying experience of humanity. We all know what death feels like. We all know what hopelessness feels like. Sin is this downward bend, this selfish pull, the life of unbelief, and it's a person who has turned in upon themselves where they only care about their needs and no one else. As Lutherans, we hold to the belief that we can't save ourselves, and Luther had a strong belief that we are unable to even come to God because of our sin. We have a deep problem. We have a sin problem, and we have a problem of not being able to do anything about it. Are we capable of doing good? Yes, we can do good. But when it comes in our relationship with God and trying to respond, we don't have this. We try and we strive, but we can't. Paul uses the metaphor of death because death is final. We all have been to funerals. We all have experienced the death of loved ones. We know what it's like to know when someone is no longer there. After school every day growing up, I would go to my grandma's house and we would play games. We would play board games together as I'd wait for my mom to come pick me up. When I was in third grade, she passed away. We went to the funeral, and it didn't quite set in that she had passed. And so I went to school just a couple days later, and the bus is about to drop me off, and the bus driver keeps driving, and I get dropped off with my sisters instead, and we walk home. 
And it was in that moment, I asked my sisters, like, why am I going to grandma's house? I'd like to play games. It'd be fun. That it hit me. She's gone. She's gone. I think Paul uses this metaphor because it's final. Death feels hopeless. In the midst of the grips of death, there's not much light that breaks in. And Paul uses this metaphor to bring the Ephesians congregation to realize that this is dire. But that's not all that Paul says, and that's not the final word. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and is seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, from life to death, from death to life through Christ because of great love. I love how Paul first shares that the reason God does this is because it's out of great love. God does this out of great love. The way God operates is so different from the gods of the time where you have to pay homage, where you have to do things to get those gods to like you, where those gods, when you read about them, they just act like your Uncle Barry, Who gets mad when he doesn't get his way? Sorry if you have an Uncle Barry. But this God doesn't act like that. This God is different. When we were dead, it's out of great love. We have nothing to bring to the table, but it's God that makes us alive. This grace is a free gift. We can't possibly earn it. And this, again, is where our figure Martin Luther took such a strong stance on the unmerited favor of God towards creation. And there's a... A direct line to the creation narrative here. God sees creation and out of love, he speaks and he orders creation. And creation becomes what we have today and what we get to experience, both the good and the bad. God does the same thing with us. This became a point of great assurance for Luther, who spent so much time wondering if God even loved him. But because it was God alone who chose us for salvation, We can find hope in this because it's not in our doing. Because if it's in our doing, we are going to struggle. But it is done out of love. It's God himself who takes it upon himself to save creation. And how do we know that we are saved? Luther would ask and say, it's because God has saved me. And there's deep insurance in this fact that God stands by God's word, that God has saved us. Again, the theologian Karl Barth was asked, When were you saved? And he would say, Easter morning, AD 33. Christ and Christ alone is what has saved me. Paul goes on in Ephesians and he says this, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God provides a remedy, but also God provides the vehicle. God gives us faith, faith to trust in him, faith to come to him, faith to respond into the grace that is operating in our lives. Some traditions hold that we are the ones that are responsible for making the decision, but Lutherans believe that it is God that gives us faith. God answers the problem and God gives us the vehicle. We are stuck in an unsolvable problem. We are in sin. There's no way for us to come to God. So, God gives us grace, and God gives us faith. God takes care of the problem that separates us from him. But what do we mean by faith? What does that mean? Again, it's a word we throw around. Is it just these set of beliefs that I mentally assent to, and I say, yeah, that makes sense, sure. And by that, we're saved? What is faith? Faith is trusting that God alone has saved us. This is out of our hands, and we are responding to steal from our Wesleyan brothers and sisters, it's meaning that we feel our heart strangely warmed. Faith is trust. Faith is simply trusting in God. When you get on a plane, you trust that it's gonna get you from point A to point B. When your spouse, when you said yes to your spouse, you have trust that they are going to be your spouse. It doesn't always work out. 
Faith is trust in the goodness of God. Grace is the gift, no strings attached. Faith is a vehicle for how we receive grace. It's how we experience the mercy and love of God in our lives. And this faith, it is the gift of God. So what does it mean to be saved? I had a friend write this, and I loved it, so I stole it. And he says, this is what it means to be saved. To be saved is to be assured that the love of God has rescued you, and it'll never desert us. It isn't going to deprive us of the fulfillment that comes with all the promises of God. To be saved is to be in a place where the presence of God will never be revoked, and where God's light will shine on us forever. To be saved means that God has brought us from death to life. It's not of our own doing. And I want to end this with a a pastoral concern. Throughout this series, we're talking about what Lutherans believe, but also I don't want to just teach random facts. Though they are important, there's going to be teaching, but I also want to preach. There's something that we need to respond to. There are problems that we experience that facts don't necessarily help us with. So I want to do a little preaching now. What do we do about doubt? If, we are, if God has given us this faith, if God is the author of our faith, then why do I have doubt? Why do I experience frustrations in my walk with Christ? Why is it when life doesn't go as it should, one of my first inclinations is to go, God, where are you? Where have you been? You have saved me. You have given me this faith. Why, why do I have doubt? Where is this frustration coming from? What am I to do with this? Because if I have doubt, if, are you not saving me now? And I think we have all been there in one way, shape, or form where we experience, we've gone through what people call the dark night of the soul, and we ask this question, am I even allowed to have doubt? The answer to that is, yeah, you can have doubt. It doesn't discredit you from salvation. There's a wonderful book that I love, and it's called The Sin of Certainty. And it's the idea of what do we do when in the midst of great doubt, how can we still trust God? And it walks through biblical figures who had doubts, and God didn't leave them. God didn't step away. And it talks about how often doubt can be the vehicle of a deeper faith, that doubt actually has a space and a place to play in the lives of believers. First, doubt encourages authenticity. Doubt allows us to be honest about our questions and our frustrations, that we don't have to pretend to have all the answers that lead to a superficial faith, that by acknowledging our doubts, we can create space for genuine exploration and growth in our relationship with God, that doubt promotes humility. It's okay to say, I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. People in elected leadership would do well if they could answer that question with, maybe I don't know. That's a good thing because it promotes humility. It deepens spiritual maturity. Wrestling with doubt can lead to a deeper and more mature faith. It challenges us to grapple with questions, theological concerns. How do I read it here, but yet apply it in my life? How do I do this? And how do I do it in a community of faith that sees the world quite differently than me? It strengthens our trust in God. Because when we wrestle, we can realize that God is big enough to handle our uncertainties. God is big enough to handle our doubts. We discover that God isn't dependent on us holding God up. That God is the one that holds us up. And it encourages community and dialogue. This is a space where you don't have to walk in, hold on to your doubts by yourself, and then go home, where you wrestle alone, where you're frustrated and concerned. Wrestling with doubt allows us to do it in community, and we get to talk together, where we find support and we find help. We may not find all the answers, and there may be things that we bring into a turning, and we're like, why was this this way? But that doesn't preclude us from God saving us. Doubt can be a good thing, but one of the ways that it becomes a good thing is when we wrestle it, not alone, but when we wrestle it in community together. 
It is by grace through faith that you have been saved. And it's because of that, that God's orientation, God does all of this because God simply loves me and God simply loves you. Not because of what we can produce, which I know many of you and what you do in your jobs, you guys are very impressive people, but it's not because of that. It's simply because God loves you, God accepts you, and God sees you and says, my creation is enough and my creation is worth it to me. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran. And our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.